What's going on guys? My name is Noah. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm really excited for this episode because today I get to interview an addictionologist. And not only do I get to interview an addictionologist, but I get to do so from the perspective of an alcoholic in recovery, and he happens to be my dad. The, the combination is a potent, fruitful one because I can approach him in a way that I just don't feel like most people can. Without further ado, Dr. Paul. You're gonna ask me the hard questions, I, I can tell. I am gonna ask you the hard questions. All right. I, I feel like something that is lacking on YouTube is, is a situation where two people can get together in this format, a professional, uh, just a everyday person, and break the barriers down a little bit. All right. So I'm hoping to achieve that, and I'm really glad you guys are here. This is all in conjunction with an addiction summit that my dad put on that I helped to produce that is going to be for free, that we're gonna give you information about. Uh, the whole idea is sharing information and, and helping as many people as possible. So, as many of you know, I'm early in recovery. That addiction summit was huge for me. Producing it helped me stay sober, and, and uh, I don't forget that. So let's start. Are you personally an alcoholic or an addict? Because if you're not, I don't really understand why anyone would trust you or feel comfortable learning from you, quite frankly. Well, I'm glad then that I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also a pediatrician. And um, I had a fellow pediatrician once who didn't have children. And I was going, well, how can you know what to say about kids when you don't have kids? Right. He, he, his feelings were so hurt. Oh. Nevertheless, it totally makes a difference. If you've gone through the struggle of alcoholism as I have, yeah. um, I'm one of those alcoholics who the first time I drank, I loved the effect. I wanted more. Right. And, you know, whenever I could get it, I drank. Right. Uh, I was addicted to cigarettes. Uh, but alcohol is my biggie. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think that's important. I just I yeah. feel like if you haven't been through it, then it's theory. It's theory. Yep. And and living it and learning it are two very yeah. very different things. Yeah. So so anybody that's struggled with alcohol or drug addiction as you have, mm -hmm. you know how hard it is to stop. Oh yeah. Right? And I went through that. So Absolutely, it's it's important to have gone through that journey or beyond the journey. We're always on the journey. We're always on the journey. Yeah, yeah. and I, I appreciate that. I just think it's important that people understand yeah. that you have that background. So when you were drinking, what's the most embarrassing thing that ever happened? Right here on YouTube. Huh? Right here on YouTube. So this right. guy always throws everything out there. It's like, doesn't he have a filter? And now you're gonna have me join your world. If you want to be on this this beautiful platform, sir, all right, all right, all right, come, all right. Come on to my level. Well. Um, the one that comes to mind was I was so drunk I was in a blackout yeah. and I'm just peeing away in the toilet, I think, and it turns out I had gotten up in the middle of the night in a blackout, go to the corner of the bedroom, it's carpeted floor and I'm just whizzing away. Oh. And um, I was told the next morning oh, by gosh. my wife that, uh, yeah, that was you there in the corner. Yeah, that was bad. I, I can sympathize and empathize with that. That That is definitely something that's happened to many of us uh, alcoholics. I had a night where I was just at a party. I was just having fun. And I woke up the next day in a room I did not go to bed in. And mm. I had my t-shirt on as pants, one leg <laughs> through the, the head hole and one leg through the arm hole. And I sit up in bed with the shirt on upside down, nothing else on, and I put my feet down and there's just pee all over oh, the floor and then all my clothes on top of the oh, pee. Oh, lovely. And, and these are the sort of things that can this become... This probably at a girl's house that you were trying to impress. Not quite, not quite, but yeah, <laughs> but what's, what's, I mean, it's, we can laugh at it, but yeah. these were, tr uh, they seem, they seem funny, but yeah. these are actually very depressing yeah. realities of what, what drinking was like for right. us, which... Yeah, no, you know, um, I go to meetings of 12-step program sure. and you'll hear stories of people who wake up in a foreign land. Wow. You know, in a blackout, they buy a plane ticket and they go somewhere and wake up or come to. Oh my gosh. And it's like they are in a, in a, in a different country. No kidding. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Okay, um, question number three. How old were you when you got sober for good and, and found a different lifestyle? Gotcha. Well, I'm 61. Now. You look good, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I take after my son. Ah. Big no-no. He's got the guns. <laughs> they let you around with those, huh? Yeah. No permits required. Okay. Um, so my first serious go-around, I was 43, and I relapsed after three months. Why do you think that was? 
my first sponsor kept showing me parts of the big book, which is the book that the 12-step folks use, right. um, that said you cannot safely have a single drink. And I was like, that can't be. <laughs> because alcohol was such a big part of my life. I'm sure. going, and there's a lot of places where it says that. I'm going, no, no, that can't be. Yeah. So I kept looking for reasons. And then finally, it just made sense to test out the theory yeah. because I'm thinking, well, maybe I can. Right. I mean, I've got three months, you know. Like right. I thought I'd really accomplish something sure. after 15 years of solid drinking. Well, I mean, in, in, but three months was a lot. That's a lot of time for someone who's been drinking then. heavily for 15 Needless years. Needless to say, I have the phenomenon of craving, right. which most people who have addictions or alcoholism have. You take your substance of choice and boom. The phenomenon of craving struck and I didn't stop for another two years. years so off. 45, uh, 15 and a half years ago. Uh, was when I got sober finally. Yeah. God willing for the last time. God willing for the last yeah. time. I, I can really relate to that actually, especially in the time frame of two years specifically, mm -hmm. because I had acquired some time back in 2015, 2016. I was doing part of what was suggested to me, but I was 100% still relying on my own best thinking, my own, mm -hmm. my own, uh, instincts mm -hmm. for myself you know they, mm -hmm. they teach you your whole life to just let your conscience be your guide and right. trust your gut you know right. we grow up learning these things yeah and i just could not get my head around the idea that i couldn't safely ever do it again it just seemed impossible and right. so i tested it out as well just determined to prove that life could i could have the glory of drinking and and also the security and the follow-through of being sober and being responsible and it took me two years and just a freaky amount of discomfort, yeah. pain, financially, emotionally, spiritually, to barely make it back this yeah. last time. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's crazy how testing things out can turn into who knows, who knows how long. And I'm so grateful you did find sobriety and that you've embraced the journey yeah. because um, this disease takes a lot of people out, yeah. which is partly why we're talking about this because we want those who are suffering to find a way to get out of that right to, to chart a different course yeah and it's a yeah. genuinely scary hopeless yeah. state of mind the, this this last time around I don't want to divert this to be about me but right. I've never felt so desperate and scared for everything about life in and all parts of it mm -hmm. this last time I got beaten up bad yeah and you had to uh, watch that but on to the interview I, I am happily in recovery and sober now and I'm doing so much better you sure are so, um, question number four though, mm -hmm. which I think we sort of touched on, but let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper. Why do so many people relapse in the face of what typically is just endless proof and mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence suggesting mm -hmm. that when they drink or use, mm -hmm. life gets terrible? Like, why do people relapse when their history is so abundantly clear that it's dangerous and, right. and potentially life-threatening? Right. Uh... When I have patients in my clinic and we're just getting to know each other, I, I deal mostly with opiate addicts, but sometimes there are other substances, alcohol, meth, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell them relapse is expected, but not required. And why do I say that? I want them to come back if they relapse. Mm -hmm. I don't want them out there dying, which is what we do. If we're an addict or an alcoholic and we relapse, we just say, oh, well, it's over. So is that out of shame, embarrassment, big shame. self defeat? Yep, big shame, and, and, and the doctor's going to kick me out. Mm. And I just want them to know if they're honest with me, I can handle it, right? Yeah. What I need is honesty. But to answer your question of why, why do we relapse? I think it's because the whole reason we drank or used drugs to begin with is some form of pain, mm. some form of anxiety. Uh, physical, emotional pain that we're trying to relieve with alcohol or with our substance. And so when we finally get on the journey of recovery and we stop using alcohol or our substance, we're left kind of raw. Right. And uh, there's a lot of work still to do, yeah. right? To, to learn how to live with that brain of ours that a lot of us have spinning, you know, just endless thoughts. I have it still to this day. I choose to use tools that I've learned in, in everything we're talking about in 12-step work and in other work to not go back to, you know, I trying used... to manage my pain with alcohol. Right. It just, it, it wasn't working anyway at the end. Yeah. Right. 
So kind of like that whole attitude or the mantra that you hear where the, the problem wasn't the problem yes. per se, it was the solution. Right. So uh, I think that's something that has definitely trapped me and something I'm trying to learn more about is the fact that removing alcohol is, is a must. It's a jumping yes. off point, it's a needed step, but sitting there and just not drinking and my experience has never been good enough. You were miserable. I'm miserable. Miserable. If I'm just not drinking, right. then then uh, it, it's almost worse. Right. Right. Yeah. Because now whatever your pain was is there, and you don't have even the relief of the alcohol in or, your case, or the coping mechanism, or that and coping tools. mechanism. And so it's so important for everybody that's looking at this and struggling with an addiction. To realize that you've got to plug in, right? You've got to plug into something, yeah, right. Absolutely, yeah. So where like, that sort of leads very naturally into the next question, I am fortunate enough to have been sort of brought up around uh, a recovery sort of world because yeah. of your experience getting sober when mm -hmm. I was in high school. So I've sort of known that there were options out there. There were things I could do, places to go, so to speak. Help mm -hmm. was available. Yes. A lot of people feel isolated. They don't feel like help is available. Or they just, they're, they're so new to this whole phenomenon that they might have an addiction problem, that, that their life is unmanageable, let's say, mm -hmm. and that maybe they're suffering and they need to do something about it. Where does someone even start? Yeah, like, where, where do you start? Where do you start? Where do you start? Uh, there's a number of different ways. So there's no one way to get on the path of recovery, mm -hmm. which is, you know, getting, taking control of your life again and not having addictions run your life. Uh, you know, as you've alluded to, there are the 12-step programs. These yeah. are free. They're anonymous. I got exposed to that when I was in medical school. We had to attend a few AA meetings. I forget that about your And story. Uh, so I knew that they were out there. And so when I was ready to do something, I just walked into a room. Right. Obviously there's treatment centers. There are addiction specialists. There's counselors who deal with addictions who you can see. Uh, I've got a book that's coming out in September, The Addiction Spectrum, which outlines a whole host of different things one can do. And I've got an entire summit where I've interviewed 28 experts. And that's coming up August 13 to 19. That's going to bring all this information online for free that people can just watch. So I know you're going to share the link of that so people can just plug in. Absolutely. And uh, you can start on this journey. What would you say to someone who isn't sure if they have a problem? How do you know if you actually have a problem with addiction? How do you decide? Gotcha. Um, first of all, we can't decide for that person, right? although there are lots and lots of screening tools that if they were willing to be honest, I've got some of these in my book, uh, but you know, in the end, you've got to look at your life and say, you know, am I happy? Am I being as productive as I want to be? Uh, I love the, 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 the tool of looking in the mirror, mm -hmm. and uh, I've heard you say it, so maybe you can say it again. Just, just look in the camera and tell them what they need to do, because I know you've done this before. So when I was in rehab, I checked myself into rehab at 25, and I'm only just getting sober now, so it's an insidious disease. But when I was in rehab, one of the counselors asked me, uh, told me a test. He said, if you can look yourself in the mirror for 30 seconds, don't break eye contact, and you can say, I love you exactly the way you are, there's nothing wrong with you, and there's nothing I want to change, and mean it, and hold eye contact, then you're probably all good. But most people, mm -hmm. I would dare say nobody, can yeah. look themselves in the mirror for 30 straight seconds and say those things right. and mean it when deep down they know they're not living you their truth. You just can't lie to no. yourself. It hurts too bad. And the thing is that the I started. End I started crying, by yeah. the way. At the end of our addiction, we're feeling empty inside. Oh, yeah. I mean, in my case, I'm putting on my look good, right? Because I'm still a busy doctor. I've right. got patients. I've got a family I'm caring for. I'm, I mean, I'm just juggling all this stuff. Yeah. But I am feeling totally empty inside. Right. There's no way I could have looked in the mirror and done that. And the other thing is just look at your life. I mean, are you, are you doing everything you had hoped you would be doing at this stage sure. of your life? You know, are you being productive? Are you supporting yourself? Are you a, a benefit to others? You know, are you being of service to others? And, and are you, you know, happy? And, and not just that pleasure happiness, right? So Sustainable. So, yeah, that inner joy. Because yeah, I think... 
Okay. As I think back to my addiction, alcohol was just pure pleasure, but right. it wasn't inner joy. Right, and there's a big difference there, There's a actually. big difference. And so when you start looking at all those factors, if you're really being honest and if, if the answer is no, you know, I'm not being successful, I'm not being productive, I'm not happy, I don't have inner joy, and uh, I'm not, you know, my life is falling apart, uh, you may want to change something. Right, and yeah. it always starts with that. It's that recognition that I need to do something, and then you just plug in to whatever tools you can get your hands on. If you start getting a thirst and a hunger, this is what you've done, which is so exciting to watch. Sure, you have a thirst and a hunger to learn more and plug in and do whatever you need to do. Right, right. That just I'm going to do whatever it takes, and the transformation, like what you've done in the last three months, it's mind blowing. And Thank your, you. your folks who know you and have watched, I think they know this. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that, and it comes from. Uh, a sincerely humble and desperate space because like we talked about in the beginning of the video that two years that ended up going by when yeah. I decided I would try things out again mm -hmm. I did not know how low I would get in those two years I didn't know it would take two years and with that mindset I, I just I have no idea how long I will have this willingness and I know mm -hmm. that I need to nurture it yep. build up my toolkit build the rituals build the habits I need to be Hungry while I'm hungry yep. so that when I have a hard time, which is inevitable, yep. I have a deep-rooted schedule with it, right? Like right. just being active in recovery, doing the things I'm being asked, staying humble, working hard on staying sober is yep. second nature yep. so that I don't just go back to my old behavior the right. moment things get hard. It's, it's a fear got me started and mm -hmm. I'm learning that, that trust and higher power for, for what I'm personally into yep. is going to help carry me through. Yep. Um, I think what I want to do is just finish up with one more question that just popped in my head sure. and then I want to reiterate some resources we have for you guys. The question that popped in my head was given where your life has gone, things that are happening, do you regret being an alcoholic? Like, Do you wish you had just been born a, a normie, a normie being defined as someone who can take it or leave it? Uh, alcohol does yeah. not impact their life in, in a negative way. So for the longest time, I really resented the fact that I was struggling with alcohol. Right. I was ashamed of it. I would never admit it. Um, I was about five years sober before I was comfortable telling anybody that might know me professionally yeah. that I had struggled with alcohol. That's a big deal. And I still wasn't comfortable saying I'm an alcoholic. Right. Fast forward now, I've got 15 years. Right. I am grateful I'm an alcoholic. Now, you, people who hear that go, that's ridiculous, right? Because nobody as a child thinks, I want to grow up and be an alcoholic. Grow, yeah, grow up right? and be an alcoholic, please. Here's why I'm grateful. By being an alcoholic and having to struggle and having to overcome something that was really, really hard. Nearly you, tore apart your marriage, your profession, I could have lost your health. everything, yeah. right? In fact, I knew I was headed towards death. I thought at the time I got sober, I had about five years based on my liver functions were starting to bump up. Yeah. And I mean, my mood, everything was like, my body was falling apart. Yeah. And that was 15 years ago, right? So I've got 10 years of bonus years, right. and I feel healthier and stronger than I've ever felt, right. other than my shoulder that just had surgery. Yeah. But So I'm grateful. How can I be grateful? I have tools. Tools, I mean, I grew up in the church, a missionary kid, great parents who yeah. were positive, uplifting, but I didn't have the tools to know what to do when really tough stuff happens, yeah. right? So we're all going to die. What? Some of us get cancer. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, you're going to die, son. But hopefully it's not tomorrow or even next year or even in the next five years as it would have been if you'd kept on drinking. Or sooner. Right? Yeah. Or you can have another 40, 50, 60 years. 60 years. Think of that. Crazy, right? Can you guys still be here? <laughs> because we have tools. Yeah. Right? And those tools are these things like, you know, learning how to eat right how to get enough, enough sleep, how to reduce stress, how to get on your knees and be humble and ask for help when you need it, whether it be from a higher power or just the people just in your how, life. How to handle life on life's terms and, and find sustainable, organic, real fulfillment and, yep. and a sense of peace and happiness, which for me was essentially impossible to hold on to and I really thought it was in that bottle and it just yeah. wasn't. The yeah. bottle always emptied and I always had to get sober again. Yeah. And, and so, folks, he's going to tell you now a little bit about the summit, but what I have to just share because I witnessed this, you're my producer. I am your and producer. And so you were filming episodes for the summit and vicariously, this was right at the end of your drinking, you were mm -hmm. struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, vicariously, you're hearing all this wisdom from the summits. Right. 
and something slapped for you. Yeah, it did. It did. Uh, that, that's one of the main reasons we wanted to make this video. I wanted to interview an addictionologist, my dad, see what he might say for some of these questions, get him to, to maybe get a little bit vulnerable, which he did. But ultimately, it was to, to use that as a mechanism to bring up the Addiction Summit that he put on, that he asked me to be a part of and produce uh, a lot of these interviews in person. And I was in a very, very bad space physically, mentally, emotionally when it was time to actually produce these interviews. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it or follow through. I was in this weird space where I couldn't follow through with anything. Uh, but I chose to show up anyway. I almost canceled the whole thing. And I did get to inter or produce these interviews and listen to world experts talk about their respective field of addiction, health, wellness, a myriad of things, right? And even in the haze of fog and depression and anxiety and stomach ulcers and all this stuff I was in, I was, was much heavier. I heard things that gave me hope that genuinely, genuinely gave me a leg up to not relapsing immediately because all I know is, is to turn to drinking, to, to everything. It's just, it's my solution. Good, bad, right, wrong for everything. And hearing these potent, potent interviews with my dad and then these different experts just paused me. It paused me enough to hold on, to listen to the next one, to learn something new, to listen to the next one. And it didn't matter how screwed I felt. I just stayed sober and kept listening and it catapulted me into what's been an extremely rewarding, very important journey of recovery. Mm -hmm. So we want you guys to check out this summit. I desperately want you guys to check out the summit. I've got a link for you in the description. Please give the dates again, but I do want you to understand if you watch, if you sign up for the summit for free, you can watch the interviews as they roll out without having to pay. Afterwards, of course, if you just love this or you missed a couple, they are available for purchase, but that is simply a, just a mechanism they have to put in place for this model to get all of these amazing world experts to even show up, okay? They, they all wanna be of service, but they have to put this in some sort of business model, which is why you can still see it for free, and that's what we're really, really wanting to push right now, yeah. so please give that information. August 13 to 19, and the link's in the description. You just sign up and boom, you can watch them for free. There'll be four interviews each day for seven days. I'm actually in a you part are. of one of the interviews. Yes. I don't know why I didn't mention that. We got to interview you and Mike Mutzel. So the day that Mike Mutzel's being interviewed, that interview is actually a third of it is with this none other than Big No-No. And what's super strange about that, guys, is I was three weeks sober. You were barely. Three, yeah. Two or three weeks sober when they interviewed me. Yeah. I was 20 pounds heavier than I am right now. Yeah. But you still had in you, which you guys love about Big No-No, is that raw honesty. And that's, yeah. that's a gift. And actually, if you're struggling out there, folks, what you need is to pray for uh, desperation and pray for willingness. Yeah. And I know you did that for a long time. Oh my you gosh. You were praying for willingness Just, because you knew you needed help, but you didn't have the willingness to do it. And, and you have to have both. And I think that this, this summit that you guys, I believe you're going to check it out. I know you're going to check it out. Is going to help get you there. It really is. This is no game. Yep. This is no ploy. This could save your life or save the life of someone else's. And, and it's it's immensely powerful and important and uh, it helped me find that that willingness to just let go of everything i thought i was to see what i might become and i like the early results i'm hungry i'm humbled by it and i'm really glad that we could do this interview for you i hope you enjoyed it if you guys have uh if you want a part two for me uh interviewing an addictionologist i might let you guys take the reins a bit more next time so in the comments below Please go ahead and either share your experience, strength, and hope, right? Whether you're struggling or whether you have uh, some recovery under your belt. And also, what questions might I ask Dr. Paul if we do another we'll one come of back. these Ask an I will review that. We'll see you guys in the comment. We'll see you guys at that summit. Don't let this opportunity pass you, please. Thanks for having me on your thanks, channel. Sam. And thanks for all the work you're doing to save people's lives. Oh, I'm just, I'm just happy to be plugged in the solution. I'm yeah. just happy to be in the solution yeah. and not just floundering in the problem. We'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.